John Cleese is undoubtedly a British comedy legend. His work with Monty Python, his portrayal of frustrated hotel manager Basil Fawlty, and his role in films like A Fish Called Wanda are enough in and of themselves to cement his place on many people's comedy Mount Rushmore's. But in recent years, the only time we have seen the 84-year-old make any kind of media appearance is to hear him complain about cancel culture. Cleese takes the so-called threat that cancel culture poses to not just comedy but all art forms and freedom of speech in general. So much so that in 2021 it was announced that Cleese was going to create a documentary called Cancel Me to be broadcast on Channel 4. However, for anyone who was looking forward to seeing this, I wouldn't get your hopes up because recent reports appear to suggest that the whole idea has been, well, cancelled. The reasons for this appear to be that Cleese was unable to fit time for the documentary into his schedule. Whilst it's good to know that he's so busy at the moment, the fact that he's too busy to find time to make his very important documentary on a phenomenon that, according to him, is literally ending careers and killing the art of comedy, does suggest that either he doesn't really care about it that much, or maybe it's because cancel culture isn't actually the threat that it's made out to be. It's understandable why Cleese would care so much about the issue of censorship. In 1979, Monty Python released A Life of Brian, a satirical take on the origins of Christianity and religion as a whole. However, the film angered many religious groups and public figures. There were even protests outside cinemas that chose to show the film. In the UK, 39 local authorities imposed an outright ban on the movie. Some countries like Ireland, Norway and Italy imposed a nationwide ban. Cleese has brought this up in recent interviews stating that Monty Python were, quote, early targets of cancel culture, unquote. Whilst he's not entirely wrong, there are several problems with directly comparing what happened to Life of Brian with the more nebulous modern day phenomenon known as cancel culture. First off, Life of Brian was censored not by an angry outraged mob of SJWs on Twitter, but by literal national governments and local governments who did so by citing laws against blasphemy. Now, you can argue that the religious people protesting against Life of Brian were the 1979 equivalent of an outraged Twitter mob, but the only reason their protests were successful is because of the laws already in place and the politicians who sympathised with the protesters and chose to enforce them. In 2001, three million people marched in London against the Iraq war, so it's quite clear that governments do not have an issue when it comes to ignoring the demands of protesters. The second thing we need to keep in mind is that despite all of the outrage, condemnation and censorship it was subjected to, Life of Brian was a massive success. Not just in the UK, but in America and in the world over. It was also a hit with film critics and would very quickly become one of, if not the most successful, beloved and most important British comedy movies of all time. It could also be argued that the amount of outrage and controversy actually helped the movie by creating a huge amount of free publicity and intrigue, making Monty Python not so much the first victims of counterculture, but the first beneficiaries of the Streisand effect. I don't know about you, but it's very difficult for me to feel too concerned about the damage of council culture if one of your examples of its victims is Monty Python, the most successful and beloved comedy troupe in the history of ever. So seeing as Cleese is one of the most successful comedy performers in the world, so much so that even at the age of 84 his work diary is still full, I have to ask why is he so concerned about council culture? Not so concerned that he's able to find time to make the documentary he promised in a three and a half year period, but concerned enough that he's willing to lower himself to become a host on his own show on GB News called The Dinosaur Hour. The most common and obvious answer is that he's trying to keep himself relevant and in the public eye. This is possible, but I'm not so sure. John Cleese is not someone who needs to remind anyone of who he is and what he's done. Everyone already knows. He could go away for 20 years, and when he returned, nobody would be like, who the fuck is that guy? You'd be like, holy fucking shit, it's John Cleese. Cleese himself has claimed that people who speak out about these issues, such as him, 
have had their voices silenced by the media. Which is a curious statement, seeing as Cleese seems to be all over the fucking mainstream media, doing nothing but talking about cancel culture for the last few years. But what if I told you there was another example of another British comedy legend who had actually come out and said the exact opposite of what Cleese has been saying? Well, in November of 2022, Eric Idle appeared on the podcast On With Cara Swisher, and he was asked about comedians like Dave Chappelle complaining that they were being silenced. Idle responded where did he say that on snl well you're not being that much cancelled are you if you were in your room complaining to yourself i'd have a lot more sympathy for you he went on to criticize another anti-woke whinger in bill maher saying i didn't like it when bill maher complains about the audience for not laughing they're telling you they don't find it funny you shouldn't moan about the audience there's nothing wrong with the audience if they don't laugh at your jokes there's something wrong with your jokes I'm willing to bet that most of you watching this video had no idea that Eric Idle had made these comments, but I guarantee 100% of you knew that John Cleese had made his. And I think that that says a lot about this idea that the media are trying to silence people like John Cleese and signal boost people like Eric Idle. Because of his status in comedy, it's no wonder people put a lot of stock in what John Cleese has to say. It's very hard not to listen to anything he says and not think, well, he must be right, he's John Cleese. But that's simply not true. And the fact that one of his fellow Pythons strongly disagrees with him is proof of that. To be clear, I'm not saying that Eric Idle is right because he agrees with me, although he does, and that John Cleese is wrong because he doesn't, and he does not. I'm simply saying that accepting Cleese's word as fact because of who he is is completely fallacious when other comedians of equal standing as Cleese take the opposing view. Cleese has always tried to distance himself from any accusations that he is, quote, right wing, claiming that his focus is specifically on free speech. Now, anyone who has spent any time in the right-wing griftosphere has heard this line a million times before. But I think there is reason to suggest that Cleese is being sincere when he says this. Because in the past, Cleese has also been very outspoken opponent and critic of many right-wing sacred cows, such as Brexit, Boris Johnson and Donald Trump. I'm not saying that Cleese doesn't have right-wing leanings, but I don't think it's fair to say that he is, as many people have suggested, simply following the right-wing grifter's playbook. So if Cleese isn't doing all of this for publicity and relevance, and if he's not doing all of this as part of some grift, why is he doing this? Well, I think I might have found an answer. I think Cleese is 100% sincere, but I also think that he has a very big and very fragile ego, which has resulted in him being out of touch and a bit of a hypocrite. If there's one thing I've learned in all my time on the internet, it's that if you want to find the most oversensitive, easily offended crybaby, simply look for the loudest, most offensive, obnoxious arsehole in the room. The kind of guy who has facts don't care about your feelings in his Twitter bio. Now, I don't think Cleese is as bad as those guys. But he is a guy who has built his career and reputation on taboo-breaking, controversial material, and given his most recent crusade against cancel culture, you would think that, well, this is a man who has developed a significantly thick skin. In 2003, a journalist called Peter Clark wrote an article about Cleese for the London Evening Standard. It was a particularly harsh piece, with its main point being that Cleese's attempts to conquer America since moving there had been a humiliating failure, and that because of this, his career is probably over. Whilst the whole article was very melodramatic, and as well as being unnecessarily negative and disrespectful, at no point in the article did Peter Clark accuse John Cleese of saying or doing anything illegal and that he did not do. But apparently, the whole thing struck a very wrong raw nerve with John Cleese, who decided to sue the Evening Standard for libel. The Evening Standard responded by publishing an apology for the article and offering Cleese £10,000 in compensation. He refused to accept the money and their apology, calling it insufficient and took them to court. Cleese was primarily suing them based on the alleged damage the article had done to his reputation. For those of you who don't know, the Evening Standard is not a national newspaper. 
It is a free London-based tabloid that is mostly found piled up outside of underground stations for people to read while they're riding the tube. This was 2003, long before everyone had immediate access to the internet and smartphones and tablets. Cleese at this point was a global superstar. The very idea that John Cleese's reputation could be damaged by a single article written by a nobody in a free local newspaper is quite frankly laughable. It would seem that the judge, Jonathan Kaplan, agreed with this assessment, which is why he rejected this argument. However, Cleese ended up winning the case and being awarded £13,500 in damages based on, quote, the impact it had on the comedian's feelings. He added, quote, some might think that Mr. Cleese is being oversensitive, but newspapers must take consequences if they choose to attack someone who is particularly vulnerable or sensitive. Now, I have no idea on what planet a multi-millionaire comedian and movie star who is almost universally beloved could be described as particularly vulnerable, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that John Cleese, the man who is currently on a crusade to save freedom of speech from the scourge of oversensitive, thin-skinned special snowflakes once sued a free local newspaper for £13,000 because he said they hurt his feelings. Now, some of you might point out that Cleese had every right to sue the newspaper, and I completely agree, he did. But guess what? Every member of the so-called woke brigade also has their right to free speech and their right to cancel whoever the hell they see fit. This isn't about what someone has or has not got the right to do. This is a man who made a living saying and doing things that hurt people's feelings to the point where they tried to use the law to ban him him from saying or doing them, now doing it the exact same thing to try and silence a local newspaper journalist. This isn't even the first time that Cleese has sued a newspaper for libel. That came in 1989 when he sued the Daily Mirror, the second most popular national newspaper in the UK, after they made false claims about his behaviour on a movie set that he was filming on. He, quite rightly, won the case and was awarded a five-figure settlement. This, to me, is perfectly justified in its reasoning and the situation for him to enact these libel laws. There is, however, one big irony in in this case. At one point in the article, he was described by the journalist as acting like Basil Fawlty. And whilst that's not the most offensive thing to say to someone, it's nevertheless rather insulting. I mean, who in their right mind would want to be compared or described as acting like Basil Fawlty? Well, it turns out the answer to that question is John Cleese. Because in April of this year, John Cleese wrote an article for The Telegraph with the title, Basil Fawlty would be bewildered by the country England has become, and so am I. Why on earth would John Cleese choose to proudly and unironically announce to the world that he is now on the same page politically as Basil Fawlty? Of course Basil Fawlty would be bewildered by the country England is today. He was bewildered by the country England was in the 1980s, and that's a good thing. That's what kind of made him such a joke. He was a narrow-minded, ignorant, petty, angry little England who couldn't accept that the world was changing and it had passed him by. I don't really care if John Cleese wants to compare himself to Basil Fawlty, but if he's going to do that, then maybe he should give the Daily Mirror back some of the money they gave him in that libel suit in 1989. Don't hold your breath though, because it seems that consistency isn't one of John Cleese's strongest qualities. And if, if he hears this, I know he probably won't, and that offends him, fuck you, you can sue me, you tosser. This is Brother Nero saying goodnight, may God be less and where there's no sense there's no feeling.